third speaker is Dr. Christopher Ruddy, and he's going to speak on, I was only an impresario, the managing director, J.G.R. McLeod, and the pragmatics of the discovery and development of insulin. Christopher Ruddy. Thank you, John. Great to be here, and great to see this all kind of come together. Um, so, my talk kind of fits in with the other ones, and uh, taking a little slightly different perspective on, on McLeod, um, and it sort of relates to what I did yesterday, I suppose, but focusing on actually that quote, that's the title of it, comes from a, an interesting source, and, and kind of, it sort of was, was said almost in jest, but actually I think it's quite relevant to this. So, I was, so you said that title there. All right, so uh, as you might have been, if you were here yesterday, you probably saw this. You might have seen this already before. But I, I want to play the, uh, the uh, Heritage Minute again, but also kind of go in a different direction from it. So this is your play. Leonard Thompson, 13 years old, diabetes mellitus, 65 pounds. Starve the child to let them live. The treatment's as cruel as the disease. It's a death sentence. Dr. Banting. This could be it. He's the first to receive this trial. But will it save him? It's not pure enough. So we try again. And again. And again. Before the discovery of insulin, diabetes was a death sentence. Banting, Best, Collop, and McLeod's breakthrough has saved millions of lives. Leonard Thompson's was the first. Oops, sorry. As I mentioned yesterday, I was uh, a historical consultant on that project with Alison Lee and Grant Maltman of Banting House in London. And uh, so that's the whole story where I could talk about that specifically, but I won't. I just want to highlight the actor that played McLeod. A key point of the, the exercise of doing the Heritage Minute was not just to repeat or emphasize the Banting Best myth and that kind of thing, but actually to make sure and sort of uh, channeling my inner Michael Bliss <laughs> to uh, make sure all four are well recognized, if not named um, in the piece. And, and we also struggled around the, uh, what do we mention the patent? Do we mention the Nobel Prize? And if we did, how do we do that properly? And so we ended up making sure that the tagline at the end highlighted the four people. That was made the best sense. So anyway, but uh, on January 18th, almost exactly one year after the seminal events depicted in this Heritage Minute, Professor John J. R. McLeod wrote a revealing personal letter. The letter was, to, uh, was dated January 18th. The letter was to Dr. John G. Fitzgerald, director of the University of Toronto's Connaught Laboratories. And here's the letter, which isn't it hasn't been digitized, it isn't online per se, it's, I've got it from the actual files. So um, McLeod wrote, and at the time, uh, uh, Fitzgerald was on sabbatical himself in, in California for a year, so, but he very much in, in connected with everything. So McLeod writes to him, we are doing our best here to keep up with the extraordinary pressure and to supply insulin whenever possible. I'm afraid that there are, are many who feel that we ought to go ahead more liberally our reason for holding up two, a too free supply is not only the difficulty of manufacturing, but also the knowledge we have of, of, the, of the complications which could certainly occur if we were placed, if it were placed in the hands of incompetent persons. So far as we are aware, there have been no deaths and that, that are directly attributable to the overdose of insulin or an overdose of insulin. And we wished very much to avoid any such occurring. And he goes on to conclude, but I'm a torn, I'm torn at present between that desire to do my best for the insulin committee and to continue with the interesting research work which this discovery has opened up. So he was kind of torn at the time, actually. Um, among the Toronto team, among the Toronto insulin discovery and development team, it was McLeod who was most responsible for ensuring that everybody was doing their best, echoing that letter, actually. On November 7th, 1923, some 10 months after this first letter I just mentioned, was written to Fitzgerald, and 11 days after nurse news broke of McLeod co-winning the Nobel Prize with Banting, and then offering to split his half with Collip, 
McLeod was asked by a reporter to assess his own share in the discovery. And as it's from this clipping here, from this article, you can see down at the bottom, Dr. McLeod, Empresario. You've said nothing at all in, of your own share in the work, Dr. McLeod. McLeod, he laughed. Oh, I was the, only the Empresario, the managing director, which I found kind of struck me. So McLeod was not just expressing what might seem to be a self-deprecating characterization of his own role in the discovery. He was quite accurate in describing his central and essentially managerial role in facilitating the start and progress of the discovery and then holding it all together in the face of formidable scientific, medical, technical, ethical, economic, biological, media, and personality challenges. So the definition of empresario, the promoter, manager, or conductor of an opera or concert company, or a person who puts on or sponsors an entertainment, such as a television show or a sports event or manager director. So it's the kind of current definition which seems appropriate. Indeed, in looking at the history of the word empresario, it fits McLeod's role remarkably well. So this is a little bit of history of the word, English borrowed empresario directly from the Italian, whose noun impresa means undertaking, close relative is English word emprise, or emprise, uh, an adventurous, daring, or chivalric, chivalric, chivalric enterprise, which like empresario traces back to the Latin verb prehendere, meaning to seize, and so on. And English speakers are impressed enough with the empresario to borrow it in the 1700s, at first using it as the Italians did, especially of opera company managers. So the discovery of insulin story could certainly be described as operatic in its heightened drama and McLeod cannot, and McLeod not unlike an opera manager, opera company manager. So I just want to kind of play on that whole idea and actually you know, relate McLeod's work on several fronts in this whole story. So managing men. And we've got just a couple of clips from uh, three sort of dramatized uh, um, um, uh, presentations or films of Banting's first meeting with McLeod. So top ones from uh, The Quest and National Film Board of Canada, uh, Peace, 1958. And then there's a movie that, uh, there's a one key scene from a, a BBC movie uh, called um, Comet Among the Stars. And there's a little, there includes one scene there that's actually on YouTube of the uh, of Banting meeting McLeod from the late 1973. And then the one we're familiar with, and we heard from the star of it last night, R.H. Thompson uh, from the Gloria for All piece. So I just thought that was kind of appropriate to include that here. So McLeod's first and most challenging role as the insulin story empresario was managing the leading men in the Toronto company, especially Banting. So on November 8th, 1920 to Banting, the first meeting with McLeod started off poorly, with McLeod initially showing little interest in his pancreatic duct ligation idea emphasizing that he, that he only had superficial knowledge of the work that had already been done with pancreatic extracts by many eminent researchers, as we've talked about before. McLeod then sat back with, while he thought for a few minutes about Banting's idea, he then said, this might be the means of getting rid of the external secretion. As far as McLeod knew, this method had not been tried before. It was worth trying. Negative results would be a great physiological value, as we just talked about as well. However, Banting wasn't interested in sacrificing so much of his time and energy and other opportunities only to get negative results that might be of insignificant physiological importance. McLeod recognized, though, Banting was quite driven by his idea in that he had considerable skills as a surgeon, unlike previous failed attempts to ligate pancreatic ducts by non-surgeons. Banting could stood a better chance of completing the procedure effectively. In 1920-21, the physiology labs in the University of Toronto Medical Building were underutilized, and McLeod was in a position to encourage all kinds of medical research, as we've just talked about. And indeed, the medical building itself, completed in 1903, was designed to facilitate lab-based scientific research. It was rivaled only by Hopkins and Johns, Harvard and Johns Hopkins. And actually, for the Defining Moments Canada Insulin Project, I've written an article about the history of the medical building itself, which is quite a story. It's got an important character in this whole story that uh, kind of gets overlooked, perhaps. McLeod also recognized that Banting would need considerable direction as he, as he was quite ignorant of the research field he was proposing to enter, inexperienced at doing research and unsure of the methods and necessary testing procedures. McLeod was confident that either of his best senior students 
physiology and biochemistry students, Best and Clark Noble, could support Best in the lab and Best won the coin toss, as we've talked about. McLeod's expectations of Banting were quite low, as was his perception of him as a scientist and as a man. They were very different and, and they were very different and their tempestuous relationships seemed inevitable, especially once Banting's initial work with Best proves not successful and his scientific skills and knowledge in order, sorry, um, they were very different in their tempestuous relationships seemed inevitable, especially once Banting's initial work with Best proved successful and McLeod had to use his research management as well as the scientific skills and knowledge in order for the work to continue. The addition of J.B. Collip in December 1921 to the research group accelerated the progress towards a mere purified extract. But Collip's work also led to a better, and Collip's work, Collip's work led to a better understanding of the effects of the extract on the storage of glycogen in the liver and on clearing up ketoacidosis. However, Collip's presence added to McLeod's research and personnel management challenges. While McLeod and Banting grew increasingly at odds, McLeod and Collip worked well together as they were both experienced researchers. This increasingly tense personal dynamic left Banting isolated and best caught between the other three. Amidst the volatile personal dynamics, McLeod was responsible for completing the proof of the, that the internal secretion of the pancreas had indeed been isolated and that it reliably reduced the cardinal symptoms of diabetes in experimental dogs. Other scientists had gone as far as Banting and Best, so it fell to McLeod to convince scientifically skeptical peers in the diabetes research community his young colleagues had gone even further. McLeod's respected position within academic physiology and biochemistry organizations and with editorial boards of several journals in the field brought him credibility along with bearing ultimate responsibility for the scientific veracity of the Toronto results. And this is just, uh, an abstract from the, the key uh, important uh, meeting in Washington, uh, sorry, in uh, New Haven in uh, late December that uh, kind of really started things happening. Between uh, January and May 1922, after the first test of the extract on Leonard Thompson and the story of a diabetes cure spread, as Michael Bliss succinctly put it, McLeod was the man in charge of a situation of intense, almost unimaginable pressure, excitement, challenge, and potential. The research team had found its way to a holy grail and now they had to present it to humanity and to a skeptical scientific community. The packaging and, and presentation of the discovery would not be easy. So this is one of a key article, I think was distributed to uh, uh, some of the people that, for this meeting by Bliss. It's actually a very good article. Critical was the need to learn more about the substance the Toronto team had extracted. What was its impact on the body? What was its chemical composition? What was the, its origin in the pancreas? McLeod personally focused on answering these key physiological questions, while also coordinating research into the extract's clinical impact on diabetes, or on diabetics, and, and organizing the Toronto Group's publications so the discovery could be presented to the world. Meanwhile, overseen by McLeod, Collip and Best focused on the complex challenges of producing the extract on a larger scale at UFT's Connaught Labs, as I talked about yesterday. And the a key thing is it was in the basement of the medical building, so this was not just some lab or elsewhere in town. This was at the heart of the story. Well, Banting focused on its clinical evaluation. A more difficult challenge, especially for McLeod, was managing public understanding of and expectations about the, the Toronto discovery in newspapers. So uh, it's actually part of the Defining Moments project. I did a lot of sort of uh, research into the newspaper coverage, which is actually Limited in many ways, it took a while for it to actually get out as big as we sort of assume it might have. Reports of new or surefire cure, sure cures were all too common. Thus the natural hesitance among the Toronto team, especially initially, to engage with reporters. McLeod was particularly sensitive to inadvertently adding to misleading and potentially harmful newspaper reporting about their diabetes extract work amidst a clutter of miracle cure articles and patent medicine advertisements. Uh, and this is actually one of the first reports of the Toronto work uh, just after the first uh, Leonard Thompson. And you can kind of see in this how this uh, was described. Um, it was a surprise to Professor J.J. R. McLeod um, to be, uh, hang on, I can't, actually I'll just read the last part of it. Professor McLeod did not deny the statement, but warned the interrogator that the information was exaggerated and the harm that it would do to the, arouse false hope in the thousands of people who are suffering from this dread disease. So he's, McLeod was actually the first point of contact 
at this point in terms of the press, really in terms of, of having some sort of control over things. Although it was very difficult to handle that. As I said, uh, McLeod was the primary focus of initial media interest in the discovery and then attention shifted to Banting. In August and September, as the incident story spread in North America and beyond, especially about the dramatic use in, in prominent cases, such as Elizabeth Hughes, media management became even more difficult. In particular, public and professional questions about who deserved credit for the discovery of insulin, was it Banting or McLeod, became problematic for the Toronto Group and for the University of Toronto. So actually, the, the, things kind of came to a head. We, we've heard about the letter, uh, letters given to uh, Guterim by Banting, um, McLeod and, and Best, as well as Collip had a, sort of mailed in his later. But that, that came out of this controversy as, as the kind of sparked by uh, interest in, from the British side in the story as the um, University of Toronto offered the patent to the um, UK Medical Research Council. So that kind of raised some interest over there. And then um, some of the, uh, there was some, some discussion and people knew McLeod better over there than in Toronto. And you know, it sparked some, dis some discussion and you can see by the headlines kind of back and forth, um, you know, McLeod giving McBanting credit and so forth. So things kind of came to a head then. In the midst of all this, as Bliss emphasized, McLeod had to hold together a team of researchers who had literally clawed at each other's throats, <laughs> while also protect himself from Banting's bitter, malicious attacks on his integrity as a scientist and a man. Nevertheless, as, as, nevertheless this was McLeod's finest hour. He employed all of his experience and skills as a scientist, an administrator, and a wise human being to keep, all, keep the lid on a tremendously volatile situation keep the work going steadily forward, organize insulin production and research, and generally carry on the elaboration of the discovery in such a way that, as, that the world of science and diabetes quickly realized that McLeod's physiology lab at Toronto was giving it a very important, very precious gift. Well, McLeod was at his best, oh, sorry, with McLeod as its first secretary, the U of T through its board of governors assumed control over the management of insulin especially policies of patents and licensing, as well as standardization and testing through an insulin committee, which first met formally on August 17th, 1922. So that's behind there is the first meeting. Although McLeod not, wasn't actually there, there was a acting secretary and Dr. DeFries, but uh, McLeod was the first secretary for a while. The, by October, the committee has assumed a more pro proactive approach to the public media, particularly in response to developments with insulin patents responsibility for which was given to U of T by Banting, Best, and Collip as a public trust. McLeod led this process so as to prevent commercial exploitation of the product and to safeguard the production of a standardized product. On October 21st, following a reporter's uh, interview with committee member Dun Dr. Duncan Graham of the Toronto General Hospital, Vincent Committee, through McLeod as a secretary, issued an authoritative statement to the Toronto Press in response to a set of specific questions including the assigning of patent rights to U of T. So this kind of summarizes, the, the, the meeting minutes of the insulin committee are really quite, quite useful. Uh, they're all online now, so um, it's quite a great resource if you haven't looked at it. So managing manufacturers. So between January 22nd and January 1922 and July 1923, perhaps the most challenging responsibility McLeod faced as the insulin empresario was the management of manufacturers, especially the unique one-year partnership between UFT and Connaught and Eli Lilly of Indianapolis, which began in June, 1922. So you can see some of the letters, um, one letter here. Now McLeod brought to, us, to this arrangement an instinctive distrust of pharmaceutical companies, coupled, with, uh, coupled at the same time with familiarity with the leadership and the experience of Connaught Labs, along with a sense of urgency to establish a safe, effective and standardized and accessible supply of insulin to North America and beyond. The Lilly relationship required considerable patience, diplomacy, and perseverance, especially with Dr. G.H.A. Clues, at least director of research. So this is one extract from one of the early letters just after the May, the big May meeting in May um, that we're sort of marking right now that um, with McLeod in Washington, attracted a lot of people, including Clues. And you can see here, since seeing your paper in Washington and having the opportunity to talk with the matter over with you and, and Dr. Collip, I'm more than ever con convinced of the necessity of starting more work on the problem with large scale production of this product with as, as little delay as possible. Your paper, as you notlessly re realize, has created an extraordinary 
a matter of interest throughout the country. And I, and, uh, <laughs> I've uh, already, and basically he's anxious to work, uh, get working on things as quick as possible, but that was not a simple matter to do that right away. Beyond the many challenges involved with overseeing the complexities of developing large-scale insulin production methods through the UFD Connaught Eli Lilly partnership, McLeod was instrumental in facilitating localized small-scale insulin production efforts in several diabetic uh, diabetes clinical settings, as well as university labs in Canada, the US, and beyond. For example, the Potter Metabolic Clinic in Santa Barbara, California, which I'm working on a project for them right now, actually. And this is one of a, an interesting letter right here. Um, can read. I'm, this is from, uh, from a cloud to Dr. Sansom in Santa Barbara. I'm much interested in your letter of June 15th and, and that you are having with quality, uh, and that's, sorry, and the progress you're having with quality production of insulin, much the same trouble as we've had. The enclosed copy of general directions may assist you. I may say that we have recently been using nothing but adult beef pancreas. We have placed the matter of quantity production in the hands of Eli, Eli Lilly of Indianapolis. We're making every effort to produce the extract in large quantities. This of course does not uh, mean that we are, uh, uh, mean that there, we are other than delighted to have you do what you can to prepare extract. The only thing in connection with the pre preparation that in justice to the Eli Lilly company we must safeguard is that no other commercial firm could, should at present obtain knowledge of the method we are using. You will therefore for the present least help keep the information I have given you for private use only. So just one example. And then back here, actually um, at the University of Alberta, Collip uh, was able to produce insulin on a fairly small scale, but had a big impact as it was covered in the news at the time, this early December. Um, a child in a state of diabetic coma practically at death's door is reported to have been brought back to life at the University of Alberta. This wonderful recovery was made possible through the use of insulin serum manufactured in the University of Alberta by Dr. Dr. Collett, professor of biochemistry at that institution. So this was, this was these were the first, some of the first diabetic coma resurrections, like the death's door idea. So there was, there was a kind of flurry of that in early December. Finally, uh, University of Adelaide in, in Australia, as this uh, letter from May 1923 uh, from uh, the uh, University, of Alberta, uh, University of Adelaide. Uh, we are producing considerable amounts of insulin. We have rescued one case from coma and are training half or treating half a dozen others. So this treatment has been an unbroken record of success. So McLeod was in the middle of all this, trying to control things, but also make it free, like balancing that idea. McLeod's role in, in facilitating the introduction of insulin production in Denmark and Scandinavia began in a more directly personal way. October 1922, August Crow, a physiologist from Copenhagen, on tour in North America following winning the 1920 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for his work with capillaries and their role in blood flow during exercise. It was an extensive lecture tour with his wife, Marie, who also a scientist and a diabetic herself. Marie was intrigued to hear about the dramatic effectiveness of insulin advancements in its production. So uh, on Krog, Krog's interested, was interested in exploring how to produce insulin in Denmark. And August writes to McLeod about visiting Toronto. So here's a letter from, from McLeod to Dr. Crow. Your letter dated October 23rd uh, only reached me this morning so that I was just addressing it to you now uh, at Washington. Um, I said that we are, we'll be delighted to have your department take up some work with insulin, particularly since it will be put in charge of Dr. Hagodorn, whose work, of course, I am familiar. We'll be delighted to have you visit Toronto at the time you are in Cleveland, um, as, as it will give Dr. Mc, Mrs. McLeod and myself great, uh, great pleasure to treat, sorry, to have you as our guest and spend a day or two with us. Anyway, they, they visited us and it was quite important that they stay with McLeod and were able to meet with everybody at the time. So they visited Toronto on November 23rd, 25th. They stayed at McLeod's home and spent considerable time in meetings with McLeod and Banting and at Connaught. They also visited Elizabeth Hughes just before she returned home to Washington after receiving insulin in Toronto since mid-August. Crow left Toronto with formal authorization from the University of Toronto Insulin Committee to introduce insulin into Scandinavia. By December, 19, December 13th in Copenhagen, work began immediately towards establishing insulin production based on materials provided by McLeod and Connaught 
This work led to the establishment of Nordisk Insulin Laboratorium, which evolved into Novo Nordisk today. So there's a letter from uh, um, <clears throat> McLeod to August Crow again in March 16th, 1923. I've, um, I've made arrangements with our attorney to have the necessary papers filled out, authorizing you to register the, the name, trade name, insulin. So Krogh's Toronto visit coincided with suggestions by many that the discovery of insulin was worthy of a Nobel Prize. As a Nobel laureate, Krogh was among a select group invited to submit nominations for the 1923 award. He struggled with apportioning credit among Banting, Best, McLeod, and Collip. In a letter from uh, January 23rd, 1923, uh, Krogh's letter to the Nobel Committee, he concluded, with the information which I personally have obtained in Toronto and which also though less clearly so, emerges from the published works, one may conclude that the credit for the idea behind the work, which led to the discovery, undoubtedly goes to Banting, who is a young and apparently very talented man. However, he would definitely not have been able to carry out the investigations, which from the start and during all stages have been supervised by Professor McLeod. On January 18, 1923, Krogh's Nobel Prize nomination letter was submitted to at about the same time as McLeod had sent his personal letter to Dr. Fitzgerald, as I mentioned before. Highlighting at the start of this presentation, McLeod ended that letter by saying, I am torn at present between a desire to do my best for the Insulin Committee and to continue the, with the interesting research work the discovery has opened up. My teaching and my college administration work have, however, suffered grievously. January 15th, 1924, Almost exactly a year later, McLeod wrote to Crow. Some time has elapsed since I received her interesting letter, but I suppose by this time, the executive secretary of the Insulin Committee, Mr. Hutchinson, will have replied to the business points which came up in it. I have found it necessary to give up all work in connection with the, this committee because it came to be far too time consuming and it was beginning to interfere seriously with the, my research work. I'm still, of course, a member of the committee I'm very much interested in everything that goes on, but I've abandoned attempting to give personal attention to any of the details. In, in June 1923, McLeod's role as impresario of the insulin story came to an end when he relinquished the position of secretary of the insulin committee to Dr. Fitzgerald, albeit briefly. Fitzgerald held a position briefly for about a month until a full-time position of executive secretary of the insulin committee was created and assumed by F.L. Hutchinson, who did a great job at it. Before giving up the secretary position, Fitzgerald told McLeod, it was quite impossible for me to attempt to carry such a burden if I was to do any research or teaching. So, and there's a, it's a letter from Hutchinson um, to McLeod, and he says, uh, and this is uh, July, 1923, just shortly after he became secretary. I may be wondering how it came about that I, of all people, should be writing to you in this way on account of the ever increasing volume of work in connection with the administrative, aspects of this problem, of the problems confronting the insulin committee, I, they decided to, to employ a full-time executive officer from July 1st, 1923. They found me wandering about in a more or less unattached condition and proceeded to dub me executive secretary of the insulin committee. So Hutchinson is actually plays a major role subsequently. Um, despite leaving the post of secretary of the insulin committee and then escaping Toronto for a summer home in Scotland, McLeod, as he later told Crow, remained closely involved with insulin until 1924, less so as the Toronto Group's managing director. Hutchinson provides a good summary of what this role grew to become. Um, I've had ample, um, this is from Hutchinson again in the same letter. I've had ample opportunity to make a survey of the great volume of work that you accomplished as a secretary of the committee during the whole of the last academic year. Notwithstanding your many other heavy duties, and you will be able to realize I know that I have, I have no difficulty keeping myself busy even these summer months. By the time McLeod, in October 26, 1923, as I, um, by the time McLeod was on his way back to Toronto from a very busy summer in Scotland, he must have been exhausted. It was supposed, it was supposed to have been a time to relax, but he couldn't escape with the many necessary tasks. And there was a lot going on. Uh, people were asking about standardization and he was involved in connecting with all the um, uh, people in, in, in England and so forth, trying to come to some agreements about these sort of things. He first heard the no news of the Nobel Prize uh, to himself and Banting while on a steamship in the middle of the Atlantic. 
On November 2nd, when he landed in Canada, he was asked by a reporter if he had heard about Banting splitting his award with Best. And uh, McLeod said, I have made absolutely no decision as to the disposal of my Nobel Prize award. You may be sure, however, that my decision will, will in no way be influenced by the action of others. After being shown Banting's statement, McLeod said, yes, I've seen that. Well, I'm a Scotsman and I, I never make up my mind in a hurry. I want to consider this from every angle. November 7th, five days later, when McLeod finally announced that he would share his half of the Nobel Prize or award with Collip, he carefully emphasized the importance of the whole Toronto company. It would be invidious and quite unnecessary to try to dissect or divide up the work on insulin among the various men who were engaged in it. The University of Toronto has been given a great deal of credit for this discovery. And I would like to emphasize that, that it is a team play that did it, it's team play that did it. We found that we were engaged in a work that appeared to have in it a great benefit to mankind and our aim was to hurry it along as fast as we could to completion. McLeod went on to say, other work was dropped while this was proceeded with. It was on this basis of understanding that Dr. Collip, who was on leave of absence from Alberta University came into the work with us. McLeod, when McLeod was then asked about his own share in the work, he laughed and said, oh, I was, just, I was only the impresario, the managing director. However, as McLeod knew, and as this presentation has explored, serving as the impresario in this operatic story was certainly not something to laugh at. Thank you. So thank you very much, Chris. Uh, let's have a question or two. Thank you very much. I, I fully enjoyed that. And, and I was uh, intrigued by just a side comment that you made about uh, uh, certain challenges in working with Eli Lilly and their research director. Could you elaborate on that? Oh, <laughs> well, this the, uh, I mean, Clues was, was a unique person in and of himself. Um, he was the first sort of research director at Lilly. Lilly was in the process of trying to move from a little more of the traditional at that time pharmaceutical company and trying to be an ethical one, trying to, you know, although there was no real regulations at the time from the US government per se, but to try to build trust, as I mentioned, the kind of slew of, of patent medicine ads and all that kind of stuff that was, you know, pervasive. And, and, and also in trying to adapt kind of the post World War I German model of research and trying to promote research and especially among pharmaceutical companies, because the tradition had been to kind of regurgitate what seemed to work and not really test it necessarily. And, you know, there's a whole, um, whole, whole history of all that. But uh, Clues saw the potential of, of, of actually uh, the company, Eli Lilly, to actually invest in research and looking. And he was always on the lookout for, or it was tasked to look out for new ideas and new things. And that's how I heard about through the various grapevines, uh, about what was happening here, and he persisted. But, but he was very energetic, clues in that role. And he wrote, you know, if you could just go through the online insulin exhibit, online just, um, uh, insulin library of, of correspondence and so forth, you know, wrote very long letters and constant telegrams. And being coming from a, a US company, there, there's a bit of distrust from McLeod's point of view. And so there was a bit of you know back and forth, and, and this little uh, clue sort of pushing, and then McLeod having to kind of push back and trying to find that compromise um, to, to again reinforce the, the need to do this all in a very equitable way. Um, uh, as I said, kind of aware of all the various issues that they would have to deal with, and not just kind of think of it as another product. And and the clues and Lily knew understood that too, but they had to kind of deal with that whole broad US context and how they're gonna you know, they invest a lot of money in this and so forth. So anyway, that's, there's a personality dynamic there as well, but a lot of mutual respect too. So anyway, it's an interesting story. Mm -hmm.